I'm Ward Cooper, your host on Change Your Voice, Change Your Life, subtitled today, What's Wrong mm. With Your Voice? We have in studio Sylvia Cheek. She joins with me because she has a condition called the strangled voice. The strangled voice. You've heard about it before. It's when you have difficulty getting the words out and the sound isn't right. Let's hear what it's about. How long have you had this problem with the strangled voice? I've had it for 34 years. You've had it for 34 years? Yes. You're a young lady. You must have had it when you were very young. Yeah, I, I think it started when I was about 18. 18? Yes. What happened? Do you recall? Well, first of all, it was an automobile accident that caused some uh, head damage. Uh, I had a tonsillectomy. Uh, I developed a horrible virus. I was sick for about four months. And then I lost my voice. How long did the virus last? About four months. Did you notice the voice changing? Yes. And I went for speech therapy. And uh, immediately, because I wanted, uh, I was in college, was in my last year, and I wanted to get into uh, my student teaching. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wouldn't be able to do it with that. And so I consulted a speech pathologist. What did they tell you about your voice? Well, the one speech pathologist thought I was a stutterer. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Did you have a stutter before? No. Did you tell him what you thought? Yeah, I did. And they said, well, we'll just work with you. And then they uh, wanted me to use vocal fries. And now I'm finding out that that's probably one of the worst. <laughs> yeah. Not the right thing to do. Vocal fries. Tell us what that is. The vocal fry is uh, taking like uh, a, a vowel sound and moving it into your lower larynx. Could you demonstrate what it is? Yeah. A, a, e, 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 I, o, u. Could you count to ten that way with that vocal fry? One, two, Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Where do you feel it? Just point to it. In my local. Yeah. Right here. Right. Yeah. Did it help you doing that? No, it actually made it worse. Did you tell your clinician that? Yeah, I did, but she told me it would get better and that I should start reading in a vocal fry. So I would uh, do a lot of my research work uh, reading in a vocal fry. And it kept getting worse. Oh, eventually I just quit going because it didn't help. Mm -hmm. Then what did you do? Well, I went back to the doctor that did my tonsillectomy. Mm -hmm. And I said, what's going on here? And uh, he wasn't sure, and he checked me for allergies and told me I had food allergies. What was the relationship between food allergies and your voice? Well, I had post-nasal drip, and I couldn't get rid of the hacking cough, and he thought that might be why I had this viral type. Of you had a cough? Yeah. A hacking cough? A cough is quite often related to talking in the lower throat. That's what you were doing. I wrote that in the textbook yeah. called Modern Techniques of Voice Rehabilitation, 1973. Nobody told you about it. I don't think they knew. No. Do people tell you it's hard for them to understand you? Yes, they do. What effect does this have on you personally? And well, it makes me not want to talk to people, and it makes me more withdrawn than I normally would be. I'm rather, I think, uh, I'm rather extroverted, and 
I love being around people, and I grew up in a large family, so I loved to talk. Mm. And I stopped talking, and I started listening. Is that a negative, severe negative impact on you? Of course it was. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be a teacher, and to teach you have to talk. Mm -hmm. What did you do after they told you it's food allergy? Did you have tests? Oh, yeah. Did? Yes, I have food allergies, I do. But it didn't help. What did you do after that, for your voice? Well, I consulted, uh, well, one of the, I went to uh, my uh, general practitioner and uh, he told me that uh, it was psychiatric mm -hmm. and that I should go see a psychiatrist. So I went to see a psychiatrist. And? Hi, we're in studio right now and we're going to give you the new voice of Sylvia on The Sally Show. Let's run that, please. It, we're going to run it in just a few seconds, but you're listening to a young lady who's been told that a problem is incurable. Uh, she sought help for 34 years, and she essentially gave up, but she had hope. And we're ready now to roll a new voice. Let's roll it. Jimmy James return uh, in, in a few minutes, but first, our next guest defied all the odds. She says for 34 years she didn't have a voice, and she's been working with this gentleman, Dr. Cooper, for about four weeks, and now really can talk again. Uh, Sylvia, you're going to talk, but you're going to talk the way you mm. talked for 34 years. I think it's important that we hear the difference. What happened? You were 18, and what happened? Well, I was 18 years old, and uh, I had a tonsillectomy. And after the tonsillectomy, uh, my voice got worse. I got a virus, and I got sicker and sicker. And by the time I got rid of the virus, I didn't have much of a voice. It would come and go. Sometimes it would almost be normal. But most of the time, it was never normal. Doctor, what is that called? It's called the strangled voice spasmodic dysphonia. And, and what it, causes it? They're talking in the lower throat. My take on it is that <clears throat> it's misuse and abuse. The medical community is saying it's an unknown cause, and they look to medical or neurological cause, and I'm reporting cures of this condition for over 25 years. <clears throat> okay. By direct she, voice rehabilitation. It's a different approach. She's such a beautiful woman, and mm. she sounds like a very old woman. Yeah, when I spoke spoke with her by phone when she called. You thought you were going to talk to somebody who's what? 120. 120. <laughs> that yeah. must be very embarrassing. I would think so. How did you find the doctor? Well, I went through 34 years of searching. Uh, I tried absolutely everything. I went to every doctor in Madison. It's like I'm talking to a different person. <laughs> you are? Oh, yeah. You are. Oh, that's so scary. <laughs> So you tried everything. I'm uh -huh. sorry. And as a uh, last resort, I had tried botulism four times. And after I had the Botox treatments, my voice got worse. Uh, it got so bad that I was only able to whisper. Uh-huh. And I thought, what else? I have no recourse. And they wanted me to come back for additional Botox injections to adjust the dosage. But they'd already adjusted it three times. And it just got worse. So I decided to go with the Maverick over here, Dr. Cooper. <laughs> and I thought, what else do I have to lose? 34 years, and I had nothing to lose. She uh, is so pretty that she was in beauty pageants, but you didn't, you didn't have to speak very much, did you? Oh, yeah, I just walked on stage, and they said, hey, she looks good. And that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Let me add something, Sarah. Sure. Dr. Martin Cooper is the author of Stop Committing Voice Suicide and Change Your Voice, Change Your Life. And he says he can change anyone's voice. What do you want to ask him? Oh, I don't want to ask him anything. I'm just saying that uh, after four weeks, 
I, I'm, my personality is back. I had become withdrawn, reclusive. I had gone to psychiatrists, acupuncturists, every kind of doctor you could think of. And all of a sudden, when I got my voice back, it's like, hey, the old girl's back, look out. <laughs> The most common voice problem is a tired voice, a misused voice, it fatigues. But she had no voice. I told her when she called me that I believe I can help her come in. And she tried everything. Her speech therapist wasn't able to help her. She heard me at a medical conference and she referred her in. How long did it take me to find your real voice? Well, it took uh, my real voice he picked up in about... Oh, five seconds. Uh, <laughs> really? I have somebody God. for you. Can you... Uh, so we have somebody who would like to change her life. Her name is Kelly. Do you mm -hmm. think you could help her? If Kelly wants to change, I believe I can help almost everyone. Ah, okay. The individual has to want to change if they find that the voice is rewarding for them. And... I think she... All right, we're back in studio, and we're listening to... A remarkable change of voice, as you've heard. What's fascinating in my field is that the medical profession um, is positive. They're well-intentioned. They're positive. There are no cures, and they guarantee there are no cures of spasmodic dysphonia. I have a number of documented cures of spasmodic dysphonia from UCLA Medical Center, from Scripps, from you name it, University of Michigan, I believe, and so forth and so on. My position is very clear. Patients should get choice of treatment when they don't find the answer with Botox. I have no argument against the Botox because most people want something done to them and Botox gives them that opportunity. But when it doesn't work, there should be choice. My field doesn't give choice. They guarantee there are no cures of the condition. The word cures is pejorative, it's a negative to them. I report cures, and I use the term cures because there are cures. There are a number of the cures, and I'm just asking my field and the medical field to open discussion and let's exchange views and let me show you how spasmodic dysphonia can be cured. I'm sorry to use the term, but it's meaningful. It means that it's not a medical problem, it's not a neurological problem, because I can't change that. Back to the interview, the original interview with this young lady, Sylvia. You notice when you laugh, what happens to your voice? It goes up. You've been with me one day. Yes. You came in yesterday. You're spending a month with me. Yes. You've had three, four speech pathologists work with you. Yes. Has any one of them helped you with your voice? to bring it back to normalcy? Not over long term. I think uh, it improves slightly with breathing techniques. Mm -hmm. But they never cleared up the problem. You've had some botulinum toxin. I'll just explain that to the audience. Botulinum toxin is the state of the art and treatment of choice in the medical community among ear, nose, and throat doctors for the strangled voice is called spasmodic dysphonia. It came in about 10 years ago, and it's the rage. It's called Botox. I understand it's failing all over Europe now, and I personally, from clinical experience, find it, it fails quite often. We'll just find out from Sylvia Cheek as to what it did for her, taking botulinum toxin shots, which I say is the state-of-the-art and modus operandi in the medical community today. I see patient after patient after patient who has found that botulinum toxin has not done the job, has made the, the voice worse, but that's the state of treatment. You had how many botulinum toxin shots I for had, the strangled voice? I had four. Four shots? Yes. Over what period of time? Uh, about a year and a half. And the first shot in one chord or both chords? Uh, the first shot was in my uh, uh, adductor muscles. Mm -hmm. and that was one chord. 
What was the result? Well, I had a voice for one week. You had a voice for one week? Uh-huh. And then your voice went out again? And it got worse. It got worse? Yes. Did anybody mention the fact the way you're talking may have some effect on this condition that you have called spas spasmodic dysphonia? Did anybody say anything about that? Um, only my speech pathologist, but not, not the people who gave me Botox. No. Mm -hmm. You had another botulinum toxin shot. How long after? Uh, about three months. Three months. And meanwhile, you, were, you had a strangled voice between the first shot and the second shot. And the first shot gave you some voice yes. for a week. Perfect. So you took the second shot. Yes. And what was, where did, was it placed in the vocal cord? One cord or both cords? Just the one, and they placed it in the back cord. The back cord. And what was the result? Well, uh, I actually went hoarse. I had my voice that day, and then I slowly got hoarse. And then I didn't have a voice for about a week. And then what happened? Did voice go out again after a week, or what? Well, what? it came back. It started to come back gradually to what it is now. How long did that last? Uh, the shot? Mm -hmm. Oh. oh, I think it lasted about four months. Then it went strangled again? Well, it went strangled after, again right after the first, uh, after, oh, over, it didn't, oh, God, I think about uh, two weeks or so it went strangled again. It was strangled? Yeah. After the second shot? Oh, yeah. It never really got good. It only stayed good one day. One day? Yeah, the second time. The second time, one day you got? Yeah. And the first time you got one week? Yeah. Some boy. Yeah. Took a third shot. How long after the second shot? Or after, the, uh, that was about three months. Three months. Uh -huh. And what was the result of the third botulinum to toxin shot? One cord or both cords? Uh, they injected the front cord. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had laryngitis for a week. Couldn't talk at all for a week after that. And then? And then slowly I came back. I prayed to God to get back my normal strangled voice so that I could talk. <laughs> That's after three <laughs> botulinum toxins. Yeah. Shot. Nobody mentioned the, the way you laughed. Nobody ever did. No many, nobody mentioned the fact that you may be talking wrong. You had a fourth botulinum toxin shot. Oh, the Four fourth one was a total disaster. I had laryngitis for three months. I wasn't able to speak above a whisper for three months. You're almost at a whisper now. Well, it's a lot better than after the Botox. The Botox was worse. Oh, yeah. But the medical community is saying botulinum toxin is a state-of-the-art in treatment of choice, and it's effective 99% of the time. I guess I'm the one percent it wasn't effective for. I differ with you. I think it's just the reverse. <laughs> I would like to tell the audience my take on it and experience is that botulinum toxin for spasmodic dysphonia is failing all over the country big time. And clinically, I can tell you that. And I can also tell you that from patients who are calling from all over the country because I'm on national television, and they're telling me that it's not working for them, and they want off, even if they get some semblance of a voice, or for some, there's a very small percentage who find that it gives them a voice for a short period of time, relatively speaking, but they don't want to take botulinum toxin anymore. Why is that? Why don't you want to, you didn't want to take a fifth shot? Heavens no, I, I don't want to have laryngitis. Uh, I need to communicate. I do have family, I have a lot of friends. I'm, uh, socially active, mm -hmm. and if I don't have a voice, I don't even want to leave the house because mm -hmm. it's so dang embarrassing. Mm -hmm. the medical people tell you the problem is incurable. There's no yes. hope. Despair. Yes. I've been reporting cures. We're back in studio. Let's uh, listen to Sylvia's voice again, the new voice. I report cures of this condition for a period of years, and uh, not all people get a cure. Not all people get a recovery, but I have a number of voice improvements which patients uh, 
find is worthwhile undergoing all natural direct voice rehabilitation. I'm not opposed to Botox for spasmodic dysphonia. If it works, I'm not finding it uh, to that extent. That's clinically. So I have one view and um, the medical people have another view. We are getting ready to take a listen to Sylvia's new voice again. Are we ready? Let's go to Sylvia's new voice heard on The Sally Show. So we're gonna put you with some of our other guests. I'd be delighted. We Thanks. will be right back. <laughs> I want you to count to five again with a lower pitch voice and give this audience the new piece. Yeah, the real macho. One, two, three, four, five. And the old voice, go back to the old <clears throat> voice. One, two, three, four, five. That's fabulous! Okay, we got the wrong place on uh, this one. I wanted to listen to Sally's new voice and uh, our young man directing the show may be able to find it for me before this show is over. She had a normal voice, she sounded fantastic, and if we can find the uh, spot uh, where uh, Sally is interviewing uh, Sylvia again, then we can superimpose it. Uh, the essence of what I'm doing is to change the voice from the lower throat to the face. And what I find is that speech pathologists are telling the individuals to drop the pitch down and talk in the lower throat. Now, I was told to do that when I was trained in voice pathology, and I did that too until I realized that it's the wrong way to go and pitch is important to either raise the pitch or at times when the pitch is too high to bring it down. So it's a fascinating area. We're going to go back to Sylvia and see if we can hear the new voice again. Are we ready? We are ready. Let's go back. Oh, yeah, a lot of people never wanted to talk to me. Maybe you should talk to Kelly. I think so. Kelly, do you think you could come out from behind that screen and we could get the doctor to help you? I'm scared. I'm nervous. All right. We're back in studio. We can't get, we can't, uh, get uh, Sylvia's real voice. You heard it for a moment or so. But that voice was the voice that I wanted her to use, and it, it certainly opened her life, it changed her whole life, because she can talk with a normal voice. The issue is very simple. Is this condition neurological? I can't cure a neurological problem. I can't cure a disease. It's considered to be a disease. I can't help cure a dystonia. This problem, spasmodic dysphonia, is considered to be a neurological problem called a dystonia. It's related to genes, they say. I don't find that true. I understand and I respect the medical community. I just don't find that this condition is medical. I cannot cure a medical condition. And I say that. I report cures. I don't guarantee it. My field guarantees, as does the medical profession and Allegan, the maker of Botox, they're all well-intentioned that there are no cures of this condition. I've been reporting cures for 35 years. So there's something wrong with what's going on. And I believe it's very essential and appropriate for the medical profession and my field, ASHA, the American Speech Hearing Language Association, and the academic field, to give me the opportunity to talk with people who want to dispute what I have to say and listen to how I am helping to cure a problem that is considered incurable. Are we ready to go back? Let's go back. You're going to talk, but you're going to talk the way you mm. talked for 34 years. I think it's important that we hear the difference. What happened? You were 18, and what happened? Well, I was 18 years old, and uh, I had a tonsillectomy. And after the tonsillectomy, uh, my voice got worse. I got a virus and I got sicker and sicker. And by the time I got rid of the virus, I didn't have much of a voice. It would come and go sometimes. It would almost be normal. But most of the time it was never normal. Doctor, what is that called? It's called the strangled voice spasmodic dysphonia. And, and what causes it? They're talking in the lower throat. 
my take on it is that mm. it's misuse and abuse. The medical community is saying it's an unknown cause and they look to medical or neurological cause and I'm reporting cures of this condition for over 25 years. <coughs> Okay. By direct voice rehabilitation. It's a different approach. She's such a beautiful woman, and mm. she sounds like a very old woman. Yeah, when I spoke, spoke with her by phone, when she called... You thought you were going to talk to somebody who's what? 120. 120. <laughs> that yeah. must be very embarrassing. I would think so. How did you find the doctor? Well, I went through... 34 years of searching. Uh, I tried absolutely everything. I went to every doctor in It's like I'm talking to a different person. <laughs> you are? Oh, yeah. You are. Oh, that's so scary. <laughs> so you tried everything. Uh -huh. I'm sorry. And as a uh, last resort, I had tried botulism four times. And after I had the Botox treatments, my voice got worse. Uh, it got so bad that I was only able to whisper. Uh-huh. And I thought, what else? I have no recourse. And they wanted me to come back for additional Botox injections to adjust the dosage. But they'd already adjusted it three times. And it just got worse. So I decided to go with the Maverick over here, Doctor. All right, we're back in studio. We only have a short period of time right now. You're listening to a woman, a young woman, a beautiful woman, who suffered with spasmodic dysphonia, tried all kinds of therapies, had four speech pathologists and tried botulinum toxin. I'm Mort Cooper. Why don't the medical people consider direct voice rehabilitation? It's all natural. It can't hurt anybody. Open discussion. Talk about it. There are cures of spasmodic dysphonia. I wish you to discuss it publicly. Thank you very much. Good night.